All right, so here we are at machine learning. We're down here. We're going to talk about ensemble learning and random forests. And I've got projects that go with the lecture for each of the, this lecture and the next two after it. Uh, I found the hands-on stuff very good in this book. So we'll talk about that. And, and here we go. So um, we're going to talk about classifiers and how you combine them with voting bagging and pasting, random forests, boosting, and stacking. Various topics to talk about. So ensemble learning is where you aggregate the predictions of several different models. Um, so you have an ensemble of models. You don't just have one learning model you've trained on something. You train multiple models, and then you combine their outputs. So this seems like it would make it more accurate. It's surprising to me that this is actually cost effective in terms of processing time, but um, apparently it is. And so you can make a random tree for us, a random forest, which uses decision trees, um, and you can train each decision tree on different subsets of the data. And this is apparently one of the most powerful machine learning algorithms. Remember, decision trees are very fast to make and very fast to use. So if you want to make a whole bunch of models, it would be the best thing to use. The decision trees are just a series of if statements. They're fast to train, fast to use. And by the way, if you wanted to erase data from them, I think it would be a whole lot easier to figure out with the decision tree because you could easily go back and figure out why it made a decision it made. So uh, of all the models, they're in, in many ways uh, the simplest to understand. So then the question is, how do you combine them together? So you have various predictors. You might have a logistic rejection, regression we talked about before, which fits something with a logit function that goes from 0 to 1 um, to help you take a smooth output and turn it into a yes or a no. Here's a um, um, vector machine scalable. I forget what it stands for. Support vector machine, where it has uh, draws the widest street possible to make a straight line separating classes. Um, and therefore, the line is determined only by the instances on the edge of the street. Those are the support vectors. And a random forest classifier we talked about before, where you just make random um, choose random attributes and choose random thresholds and then classify things that way. Um, anyway, you have a variety of these things and then combine their outputs. So you can use hard voting. This is a simple way to do it. Or you just use majority voting, just like American elections. Uh, if we didn't have the Electoral College, I think the less than presidential elections actually do work this way, where you just count the votes and the person with the most votes wins. So these three vote category one. This one votes category two. So you take category two. Um, and of course, statistically, if these things all have a certain accuracy, um, then combining several of them should improve the accuracy if they are independent. Now, if they're all making the same errors, then it doesn't improve things. And uh, this reminds me of another common situation, which is arrayed array. If you have an array of five disks, so that your uh, ensemble of disks will keep running even when one disk fails, uh, what people in the industry have told me is people expected this to make your disk far more reliable. And in practice, it doesn't, because in practice, several of the disks will all fail at once, which suggests that they are not failing just because they've randomly uh, exceeded their lifetime and a bearing has given out. They're failing because of some cause that affected them all at once, like voltage fluctuations. So the same cause that causes one of them to fail will cause the others to fail. And uh, so that's the issue. This Statistically combining more data only helps if the data is independent, if the noise in one is canceled out by the noise in the other. If all the noise is moving together, then you don't improve anything by mixing them together. All right, so if you had coin tosses, for example, and your coin is weighted at 51%, it's not a perfect coin. This is the kind of statistics that every scientist knows and statistician. If you just do something more and more times, your noise will cancel out and you'll approach the constant. So if you can really have 10,000 or 100,000 samples, you'll get a very close estimate. The noise will tend to cancel out. That's the idea. Now, to train a whole bunch of different models on the data, um, you try to achieve diversity. Now, one way to do it, we talked about before, is use different algorithms. One is a uh, support vector machine. One is a random forest and so on. That's one way to do it. Another way to do it is use the same algorithm every time, but 
train on different subsets of the data, and there's two ways to do it. You can sample with replacement or without replacement. And so bagging is sampling with replacement. So I have a population, and I'll uh, sample some of them, and the next time I sample, I might get the same ones. The next time I sample, I again might get some of the same ones. In fact, if I sampled more, I might get I might draw the same one twice. I pick this one, then I record it, then I throw it back in. I might pick the same one twice when sampling with replacement. That's bagging. All right. Without replacement, you'll sample, and then you will never choose the same one twice, and anything you sample you won't um, permit in the next subset. Although, I'm not sure I'm right about that. They might only be talking about multiple sampling multiple draws of the same instance in the same subset. Um, hmm, I'm going to take this slide out. I think I'm wrong about this. Because this would suggest that if I had 100 instances and I was training 50, I could only make two subsets out of it, and I don't think that's true. You can take as many as you want. You'll draw 50 of them with replacement. And what people often do, by the way, is they draw, if you have n samples, they draw n. But if, anyway, that's um, up here. If you have n samples, you can draw n with replacement, and you really won't get them all. Instead, you'll get some of them more than one time. So the various groups of samples will be different. Down here, you have to draw some number less than n. Anyway, um, so you make your predictors. You train them in parallel. This is one good thing about it, since you know GPUs are highly parallel things. You could All these could be trained in parallel on the subsets of data. So you have your training set here, and you pick subsets, like the colored pieces, different subsets for each model, and then just train them all at once. They have all your predictors. All right, so here's an ensemble of 500 decision trees. Um, so here's one decision tree, um, overtrained. That's what you get. to where it, it punches the data, clearly fitting the noise. And then you take a whole series of them and train them with bagging, so you get an average, which is a less perfect fit to the data, but it is more um, meeting the real trend here. I think in drawing one sample, you don't put the item drawn for the next draw, but at the next sample, that's right. That's what it is. So if you go back here, you sampling with replacement means I draw one, then I draw again from the entire set, then again from the entire set without remembering which one I've drawn before, so I might draw the same one twice. That's the point. So I'm going to throw these slides away or remake them. It's not really an issue across multiple sets. It's an issue of how you make um, the, f the one set. All right, so if your training set contains m instances and each predictor draws m with replacement, then it only uses 63% of the samples. So there are 37% it does not use, and that's, um, that's what I'm saying. Therefore, it must have drawn some of the others twice. And those are called out of bag. So you can use them as the test set if you like. Um, all right. So random patches, you sample both training instances and features. Remember, um, the features are the properties of the instances. And if you have data coming in, like a uh, image, it might have a whole lot of data points. Like even those little numbers we had were 28 by 28 pixels. <coughs> so they had 784 features in each one. So rather than taking the complete list of features for every instance you're using, you could sample the training instances and also sample only some of the features. Or you could keep all training instances but only sample the features. These are various ways to do it. All right. And so a random forest is an ensemble of decision trees, usually done by bagging, where you draw m samples from a training set of m instances. And you can do this as many times as you like, and you'll get a different m samples. Each sample will have about 2 thirds of them used. It'll be a different two-thirds each time, and a different number of the ones that are doubled up. So, um, all right, you use a random. Also, you use a random sample of the features, only the square root of the number of features. And that will increase tree diversity, even if you use the same samples, you use different features of them. So you'll have very different input data for each of your models. All right, so that's one way to make them. And clearly, you can make as many as you want this way. And then you have extra trees. This is a way to make them even more randomized, extremely randomized. So what you do is you use a random threshold value for each node instead of even searching for the best possible threshold. 
and this increases variance, but it makes training much faster because um, you don't have to go through a grid search at each step to find the optimal threshold. And so sometimes it performs better, not always. And so here's an example. You can examine a random forest, and now you can look at how much the nodes using a feature reduce the impurity. Remember, we had this before. The um, impurity is the extent to which one node contains multiple different classes. And um, I'll wait for this airplane to go over. I've got constant stream of airplanes here, and I can't really close the windows on a day this hot. Anyway, um, so the uh, you can see how much one node is reducing the impurity, and so you can rate how important they are. And this is uh, quite valuable. You can see, for example, for the MNIST data set, the edges are not important at all, because essentially all the numbers don't use the edges, and you see the hottest parts are in the middle. So you can, uh, that's a useful thing to know, how important the different, uh, different attributes of the images are. So let's try a Kahoot. This is 7a here. Gini coefficient, that's right. That's true. Um, I guess everybody around here would hear the same airplanes. Uh, that I think they're taken off from SFO. So they're probably hitting uh, a lot of people here. Yeah, it looks like nothing has happened about the choppy video. I don't know what caused it. Strangely, it doesn't happen all the time, but there are many mysteries with these computer systems. Actually, a lot of the choppiness in my computer system often comes from it getting too hot. So I turn the fans back on. Well, if I only have three competitors, that makes the competition too easy, but still I'll do it so we can do the reviews. People might want to view this, these review questions anyway. Forward we go. All right, so what value indicates how much these nodes reduce impurity? That's important. All right, which one uses random threshold values? The extra trees to make them extra diverse. All right. Which system ignores 37% of the samples? All right, that's bagging sampling with replacement. So you can draw the same sample again. All right. All right, now I've recorded the winners. So let's go back to here. 
All right. So, boosting. Um, forgot most points. Oh, it could be, yes, all right. Anyway, um, all right. So this is hypothesis boosting. Uh, and this is any ensemble that combines weak learners into a strong learner, and that's the point. Um, now, what you do here is you train the predictor sequentially. So you train it on one a model, and then you take the errors of that model and train another AI after it to patch the errors on the first model. So the two techniques are adaptive boosting and gradient boosting. All right, Ada boost is very simple. What you do is you take your input data and you train the model on it and the model might go like this where it misses some of the instances so then on the next model you increase the weight of the instances that were wrong the first time so you make it focus on hitting this point more precisely and train on that and you'll get a model that improves that and then the next model you focus on the ones that this one missed which are the open circles here and train it there and the idea is hopefully you'll get closer and closer to the end um, all right and so if you have a uh, learning rate equals one too high then it just jerks back and forth here we got the moon's data set where the uh, green dots are here and the red dots are here and we're trying to get a sort of s-shaped boundary and so it starts here and then it jerks over to two then it jerks over to three, then over to four, then over to five. And we've talked about this before. If you take two big steps when trying to iterate and converge, you never do converge. You bounce back and forth across the minimum you're looking for. So if you lower the learning rate, then it does something you expect. You see, it's just converging to a pretty good solution here with all the instances close together. So, um, all right, eta boost is sort of like gradient descent. All right, and so... Um, gradient boosting is another way where you fit each predictor to the residual errors of its previous one. So first, you do a training set here and you do your first model. And here, then you take your predictions um, and you have the residuals. So you have this model that gets most of the variation. Then you plot just the variant from that. So here, you see it's above the red line then it goes below the red line to below zero here. Then it goes above the red line and below again. You can see that this goes above, below, and above. So that's above, below, and above. So here you have not the original data, but just the errors compared to the previous model. And you train a model based on that. And then you continue training them on that. So that each model um, tries to correct the errors of the previous ones. It's another way to do it. All right. So there are hyperparameters to try to prevent these things from overfitting too much. Uh, if you have a low learning rate, you'll require more trees, but you'll generalize better, as we saw. Um, that's called shrinkage. Early stopping, we talked about before in uh, uh, gradient descent models. Um, you watch to see when um, trees didn't help. So you number of iterations with no change. So if the last 10 trees didn't help, then you stop adding trees. So here, for example, you have three estimators with a learning rate of one. So the ensemble prediction does this. And when you get up to 92 estimators with a learning rate of 0 0.05, you get really a pretty good fit to the data. And you know you can stop when adding more trees is not making it any better. Not, and you measure the uh, error by mean squared deviation or something like that. There are various ways to measure it. So. Then there's histogram-based gradient boosting, which is intended to handle large data sets, which is a huge problem, and we're going to talk a lot about it next time with dimensionality reduction. Is 0.05 the level of statistical significance? No, it's just the step size. So the learning rate is just how big your steps are on your parameters. So 0.05, not just, just how much you move a variable by. That's all. It's a step size. So you'd have to do more steps but you'd more likely settle to the bottom here. Yep, all right. Um, all right, so what you do for a large data set is you bin the input features. And you may remember we talked about this before, way back when we did the California housing data in the first year section lecture. There we were worried about income affecting the price of houses, so we grouped the income into five bins. And, 
And so instead of keeping the full income data for this purpose, we'd bend them. And that's what you do. You bend the input into certain ranges without keeping the full precision of it. This greatly reduces the number of threshold values. So if you have like a floating point number with millions of possibilities, then it would be difficult to find the threshold as you explore many values. But if you just boost it into like 10 bins, then there's only a few possible values and it'd be pretty easy to find which of them is the best. So that's the game here. You can use integer data structures. That makes it much faster because integer arithmetic is much faster in processors and GPUs. So it can make your training hundreds of times faster. And your computational complexity is now the number of bins times the number of instances as opposed to the number of features times instances times log of instances. So it really is much faster. And you have lost some precision, but that will act as a regularizer. Um, remember, this is a fundamental feature, by the way, in science. One thing I very often see is people in scientists will measure something. They'll say, there, I measured the concentration of, of alcohol in this blood at 0.01475%. And in fact, you didn't measure it that precisely. You only measured it to two decimal places. There's no point pretending you know four or five places on something unless you're really that accurate. So in many ways, um, I was just talking about this at the, the management class last week. If you're trying to predict the risk from something, you might fool yourself and think you predicted how many dollars per year you're going to lose from this. But realistically, you probably really don't know that with any great accuracy. And you really should just bin it into low, medium, and a high risk. That's probably all you really know. So binning it might very well be a more fair reflection of what you really know. And that'll act as a regularizer. So you get a model that fits the reality of the phenomenon you're investigating and not the errors in your data. All right, that's binning. And stacking is where you use um, stack generalization. So instead of just using hard voting, where each predictor has to make a firm decision, is it category A or B? Instead, you um, put out the decision function, which is a number which goes above and below with like, the percentage of chance that it is B. And then you do something smarter than just hard voting. You have a blender or a meta learner doing it. So down here you have a new instance. You feed it into your models, which have been trained. They predict something. And see, instead of just each one saying uh, true or false, each one of them puts out a number, which is the, uh, you know, the decision function. And then your blender combines these numbers to make a decision. And so you can train the blender uh, by feeding in a training set and see what it does. And then you can call that your blending training set. Try to train your blender to combine these in the most effective way to get the most of them right. So this is, uh, you're going to see this a lot as we go forward, where the way you fix a problem with an AI is to put another AI after it. <laughs> and uh, this is really, this is what um, Microsoft's OpenAI is doing. I think either OpenAI or BARD. I think it's OpenAI. They're trying to get the hallucinations out. And so what they're doing is if you ask it a question and it gives you a page of output, it's going to automatically generate like 10 fact-based verifying questions from the output, like my Kahoot questions. And it's going to automatically run those through the model again and make sure that they agree in order to try to catch the, um, the hallucinations. And this does lower the hallucinations by like 30% where you just verify by asking the same flawed system to take another look at it. All right. So you can have multi-layer stacking. You can have your new instance go through layer one of decisions uh, of individual predictors, then run it through multiple blenders of different types, and then have another layer of blenders. So you could, you could do this. It seems kind of crazy to me that rather than having uh, more models down here looking at the data, you'd have more models deciding how to combine the outputs. But sometimes this is considered the best solution. All right. You know, I like to say if you have a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. All we have are these machine learning models. So you just stack them up in piles to solve every problem. And that's, that's what tools we have available. So let's try another Kahoot.
Give it a few more seconds to see if we got any more competitors. All right. All right. Which technique fix each predictor to residual errors? That's gradient boosting, where you fit it and then you take just the error and make another model to patch the error. Which technique bends the input features? That's the histogram technique. Um, break things up into bins so you lower the amount of input information. Discarding information that, uh, if you do it correctly, you're discarding information that isn't useful and keeping only the useful information. And which method uses a blender? That's stacking. Everyone got that right. Good. All right. So I can guess the winners since there's only three competitors. All right. All right. So I'm going to stop this recording if I can find my